So, the next speaker is Christopher Tyler that will speak about the paradox of pictorial flatness. Uh, please, Christopher. The paradox of pictorial flatness. So, if I wanted to try and convey this experience of <clears throat> perceived depth from two dimensional images and also show where I'm talking from. This is, of course, the Golden Gate Bridge in San Francisco. And I hope you see a substantial amount of depth. But if you close one eye, I think you'll find that it, it springs into even more vivid depth impression. And you, you really feel as though the far end of the bridge is a long way further away from you than the near end. Um, so here's an overview of my the points I want to make in the talk. We mainly see pictures and their moving counterparts as flat, although representational pictures contain many cues to three-dimensional structure. The prevailing theory of depth cue combination is that each individual depth cue is encoded veridically with the cues combined into the whole in proportion to their reliability. The implication is that we should see lots of depth in pictures, yet they paradoxically look flat under normal viewing conditions, or fairly flat, suggesting that a very different combination rule is in effect. <clears throat> On the other hand, if the stereo cue were the most reliable, it would dominate all other depth cues to account for the, the perceived flatness. However, consideration of Patrick Hughes' reverspectives shows that the stereo cue is readily overcome by perspective cues at typical viewing distances. So the paradoxical flatness of pictures is not consistent with the relative reliability of stereo and perspective. Uh, so what are we talking about? We're talking about viewing pictures in picture galleries. For example, this is actually a picture gallery in, in Hull, the Ferens Gallery. And again, uh, if, I think particularly if you close one eye, you get a vivid sense that you're in a room with a slanted, slanted view of the, the flat wall uh, on which are hung an array of pretty flat pictures. So we're simultaneously getting a strong sense of depth from the perspective structure of the room, <coughs> substantial flatness uh, from from the depictions in in the of the pictures in the picture frames. So what is it that is causing this flatness? Representational pictures are distinguished from the world we they, that they depict in four major respects that we've been hearing about uh, quite a bit today. One, reduced cues to three-dimensional structure. Two, distortion of the remaining 3D cues in various respects. Three, bottom-up cues to flatness, such as the, the texture of the paintings, the painterly uh, texture. And for the top-down knowledge that their inherent physical structure is flat, it is cognitive rather than perceptual knowledge. The interplay among these four sources of depth information in pictures should be sufficient to account for their paradoxical flatness. So um, more in more detail, <clears throat> let's look at these the particular one of these categories, the cues to flatness. And one is, uh, as we've said, the Bayesian knowledge that they are, act are actually flat panels. So your prior knowledge of what pictures are typically like, uh, you're bringing this to bear on, on the picture perception. The uh, perceptually flat container of the frames. The in inappropriate object sizes the contextual incongru incongruity. Again, we've heard about several of these from, from previous talks. Um, also, limited contrast gamma range is the, the pictures can't, can't hope to match the real world in this respect. And similarly, the reduced color gamut, the painterly surface texture, 
the light reflections from the picture surface, you see uh, particularly on, at the upper right here, the incorrect perspective, except from one viewing position, as uh, Michael Kubovi touched on, and the lack of structure from motion as you move around the room, if it were a three-dimensional object, it would undergo particular uh, motion distortions in the in the picture plane, uh, as as we find in in virtual reality. But these don't happen in static pictures. So let's pick off one of these pictures just to illustrate one of the cues. This this is uh, Frederick Layton's farewell, and uh, it's, it's a, in a rather fine frame. It looks like a fairly flat picture, partly because the contrast range is, is not very strong. If, if we artificially enhance that, boom, I hope you see immediately increased depth. So this just illustrates that not only perspective cues, but cues such as realistic contrast contribute to the, uh, the full depth impression from a picture. Now, uh, we're all very familiar with the uh, cues, the, the various cues to, to three-dimensional depth from the two-dimensional array, um, the binocular disparity being the binocular cue and the rest being monocular to some extent. There are at least 12 such cues. I think you can take that list up to 20 if you, if you think hard enough about them. I don't need to go through any this list for, for this audience. Um, but I want to focus on, the, as I mentioned, the strength of the stereo cue. Uh, and it's generally regarded, I think, as, as being the strongest depth cue, much stronger than most monocular depth cues. But I was very struck by the reverspectives um, now, do you, do you see this um, reverspective on the screen? Does everyone see the reverspective? So I, I expect you're familiar with the reverspectives. Yes, me, yeah. Yeah. Thank you. This, this is just to demonstrate again that you see this dramatic motion, uh, motion distortion based on the perspective structure, which is opposite, reversed, relative to the actual disparity structure. This, of course, is a two-dimensional image, so you don't see the disparity structure until you get the occlusion, and boom, the occlusion cues you to the fact that the picture is painted on inverse to trapezoids. So the fact that you get these illusions, this illusory motion, emphasizes the dominance of the perspective cue over the binocular disparity cue. Okay, let me stop that now. Uh, are we back on my uh, presentation? Yeah. So that stereo is is not, uh, under optimal conditions, is is can't compete with perspective and, and the real, other realistic cues associated with it as as a as a, t a cue to the three dimensional structure, the perceived depth from images. So uh, here's here's a particular example um, that I found uh, two two examples that I found particularly compelling in evoking perceived depth. So one is the the traditional train track, the other is an office corridor, and particularly if you close one eye, I think you'll find it almost impossible to perceive this as a flat surface, as a flat um, image structure. It really appears to recede strongly into the, into the plane of your computer screens. I assume you're all watching on computer screens, evoking a, a vivid sense of actual um, three-dimensional tactile, if you like, three-dimensional structural depth. And in terms of the um, issue of robustness of perspective that Kubavi uh, alluded to, if, you, if you're seeing that depth and you move your head from side to side, you should see that perspective corridor uh, distorting. 
to to uh, cue you into the fact that you are are seeing, as in the retrospectives, that you are seeing a, a real sense of three dimensionality. There's this um, retrospective motion um, structure from motion, which is not happening on the screen. Uh, it's only in your head. Is an indication of the actual perceived depth from the from the perspective Q. So um, I, I want to amplify this, for, elaborate this point to uh, say that in, con conversely, even real world depth is subveridical. So that when you, if you're actually in this corridor, looking down the corridor, you can ask yourselves, well, does do the sides of the corridor actually look parallel to me? And I think you'll find that even in the real world, with full Q, no, nothing in the way between you and the objects, that you you still perceive the sides as converging to some extent. So that even uh, real world cues are not entirely veridical in the sense that parallels are perceived as actually being parallel in the world. You know they're parallel. You op operate, you walk along the corridor on the basis of, of the knowledge that it's parallel. But if you ask yourself, how do I see it? You see them as still converging to some extent. So um, I, so the, how, however, I'd like to uh, draw some conclusions from these issues of the, the flatness of pictures which give rise to a range of aesthetic experiences that are not provided by objects in the world, such as um, one is the spatial composition in the 2D frame. To, to the extent that you see it as flat, you now have a, a view of the arrangement of the objects and the balance, you know, the compositional structure and so on, that um, you don't uh, normally appreciate in the world is an aesthetic experience that is really a, a big component in my mind of picture perception. The, the secondly is the issue of robustness of perspective despite what I said perspective is to some extent robust and I think that's to the extent that the picture seems flat I saw, that would be my interpretation. The conceptual evolution of object structure within the flattened world um, the interplay of perceived size from distance so that objects far away, as we saw with the Golden Gate Bridge, um, don't seem entirely the same size when they're physically the same size in the world. So this is, gives rise to a different aesthetic experience. And finally, the trompe l'oeil effects of, of the experience of, oh, this picture actually looks three-dimensional when, when the depth is depicted sufficiently uh, vividly and over a small range so that it's not competing with the flatness cues. And this is it, it's a, it's a, a, an aesthetic experience that in a world of flat pictures you suddenly see this picture as three-dimensional or is really three-dimensional to the extent that it looks as though those letters are really resting in in the um, in the trellis in, in those um, 17th century trompe l'oeil pictures now um, I could give a whole second talk about uh, Q combination theories I'm just going to give you a flavor of it that in in terms of combining all these depth cues yeah you really have one minute Christopher yeah, so please. one minute is all I'm going to take yeah, thank you. Simple linear summation, the standard uh, modified weak fusion theory of, of the Landian colleagues. And I just want to point that I've proposed, in order to account for some of these aspects of, of depth perception, a, 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 a theory of accelerated Q interaction with univariate Q reliability weighting. So Landia Dell have the Bayesian weighting happening locally everywhere in this in the image. Whereas my view is it happens on each of the, let's say, 12 depth cues as an overall weighting of that whole depth cue. 
So the, this is the talk I would have given about all those different theories and how the experimental uh, evidence in support of them. And I, this is la the data from Landy et al. And I just point out that in the last, on the right hand side, the pink bar is my prediction of, of the uh, Q enhancement when, when the Qs are weak. So I'm going to end the, the talk there. I won't, um, I won't read through the conclusions. These would be my conclusions. So thank you all very much. So the next speaker is Dan Rai Vishnavat speaking about a non-cognitivist account of picture. All right. Um, thanks, Nicola and Alberto, for inviting me. Um, I, I think the, the title is a bit overblown given the audience here. I think, uh, um, you know, the, the, the general consensus does seem to be following this anyway. Um, so, I'm, I'm probably going to follow on the sorts of accounts that uh, Marco um, uh, and uh, and others have given. Um, also, uh, Robert, uh, this idea of uh, there being a continuity between uh, pictorial perception and uh, ordinary perception or real perception, as I call it. Uh, but I, I think the, the interesting thing here is that there are two different components that we can think of in terms of thinking about picture perception, ordinary perception, um, and the levels of analysis. So one, I would say, is the recognition component, which I think is quite broad and uh, has been touched upon really nicely, I think, by Nicola and um, and also by this idea of multifoldedness that Michael presented. And I think uh, uh, to some uh, uh, degree also what James talked about in terms of the, the broader implications for aesthetics. I think uh, Christopher also touched on that. But I'm really going to focus, my focus is really on this on the spatial component. That is, what do we see three-dimensionally when we look at a picture and how, how does that uh, form continuity with um, what we see in ordinary viewing? And what I'm going to present is um, not really anything new. It's um, a lot of it is already published, but I, I'm going to go through it anyway. Um, sort of to add to, to the to the current debate. So thinking about the spatial component, which is really the phenomenology of 3D space and object perception, the first piece of phenomenology that we often think about is sort of the distinction between these two images, one being the actual uh, regular pictorial image and the other being either a real object or a stereoscopic image, which I can't show you, but I can show you a, a motion parallax version which generates that same phenomenology. And it's this difference in phenomenology between these two things um, that that seemed in our mind to differentiate between um, uh, that that sort of suggests this discontinuity between pictorial perception and uh, real perception. And of course, this discontinuity has been um, in the literature cashed out in terms of stereopsis and the idea that it's really the binocular disparity signal that is that is doing this. And um, stereopsis is usually associated with the terms that I typically used to describe the phenomenology, which is things like visual realness, tangibility, and the sensation of negative space that we have in um, when we have that sensation. Um, but we know that the, the idea that that sensation only arises in the presence of disparity is challenged historically. Um, all of you know this, so I, most of, or all of you should know, know this. I don't need to be revising this, but um, since Brunelleschi, all the way through um, Kundering's work um, on the synopter, we know that without binocular disparity, uh, we can get the same sensation of what I'd call realness or tangibility. Um, so there's that. There's this idea that um, it's not just this, this this additional thing that is not present in pictures that is causing that sensation. But then the other big issue that I've sort of raised in the in my uh, work is. The, the issue of scale in pictures and the 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 um, uh, peculiarity of pictures in that sense that they um, have uh, scale that is their scale ambiguous. And it, if you present a picture like this that does not have any familiar objects, um, it might be consistent with an image of a, desk, a set of desktop objects, or it could be consistent with a with a huge modern art sculpture in the desert. Um, but if I add some familiar and continuing with that, if I add a familiar size object like that, 
or like that, we're equally happy with the with the change in scale that occurs. So the, there seems to be this idea that in pictorial perception, unlike um, what we seem to experience in, in ordinary perception, the scale of the objects, though the three-dimensional structure of the object seems to be fairly well defined, the scale of the objects seems to be entirely ambiguous. So one, one could think that when we're looking at a picture, what we're really perceiving is this um, is this space of potential objects onto we onto which we lock we we lock onto one of those potentials once we have some further cognitive information um, about about the scale. But we know that we cognitively lock onto it because it can be optically uh, it can be optically uh, broken. So, for example, you're all familiar with tilt shift miniaturization images such as this one by Olivier Barbieri, who's one of the few first photographers to take this effect before it became a huge phenomenon online. Um, and this is an overhead view of the Santa Monica Pier. And you can see here that despite any cognitive knowledge of the scale, we see this object as being very close to us and, and miniaturized. But also the interesting thing that we've pointed out is that there is also a, an enhancement in the perception of depth in the central unblurred region, which um, se seems to have a, a greater sense of tangibility than the original image would have had without the blur. And we've tested this and um, shown that naive observers indeed may describe the central region using some of the same terminology about negative space and tangibility that they do uh, with either monocular aperture viewing or with stereoscopic viewing. And of course, um, when we think about phenomenology in, in pictures, we need to contrast that to phenomenology in ordinary perception. And again, this has been mentioned already, this idea that that that, that sensation of tangibility or spatial separation or, or realness in depth actually diminishes with distance in, in, in even in real scenes. So for example, in the foreground, the objects um, have that uh, phenomenology of realness, while as we move um, further back into vista space, we get to a point where in vista space, we often say that the, the image looks pictorial. So here we have a case where neither is there the, the, the classic conflict of pictorial images, meaning there is no Q conflict in that, in that vista space, and neither is there any usable um, disparity. So um, the condition is neither equivalent nor uh, is not equivalent to, pictorial, to the pictorial image and yet generates the same sort of um, phenomenology. So the hypothesis, uh, just to sort of quickly jump, jump ahead, arising from um, examining the phenomenology is that depth and space entails two distinct and dissociable representations, that of unscaled relative depth and scaled absolute depth, and that pictorial depth is the paradigmatic stimulus condition generating in a sense a pure awareness of relative depth structure. And visual realness, or seeing in 3D, or stereopsis, or whatever we want to call it, this sensation of realness, is the phenomenological visual impression that we associate that is associated with the derivation of egocentric distance and, and scale that is the size of the object in scene. So either the, the scale of the scene or the, or the size of a specific object. So when we look at a picture like this one, the, 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 the idea is that we're both seeing the, we're both seeing the physical um, flat picture surface within the absolute depth representation, while we're si simultaneously perceiving the pictorial objects depicted in, in, the, in the relative um, or unscaled representation. And what happens when, we, when we're looking at a real object or say, for example, when we're looking at an anaglyph where we can generate binocular stereopsis is that the, the object, the, the information available is such that the brain is able to scale um, the object and located in a specific location in space, and therefore uh, the sensation of realness arises. Um, now, this idea of this uh, dual representation um, doesn't uh, entirely fit with a series of further observations, mostly done in, in the real world, but also uh, perceived in pictures. So this is an image that's actually from uh, Kaspar Erkelen's uh, paper on um, uh, perspective space. And this is an image where these bars are actually equidistantly spaced in the depicted scene. And yet when we look at it, it they, they, they appear to be uh, foreshortening with distance. Um, and actually, if you ask observers to, to set these bars so that they actually look 
um, equidistance in the in the depicted scene, they often uh, regress it towards equidistance in the pictorial plane. But of course, this is not a phenomenon that is just in pictures because it turns out that uh, the same phenomenon occurs in in ordinary viewing as well. So, um, and this is really nice work by Loomis and collaborators where they did the the blind walking studies where they compared a blind walking to in the, in, in, to individual uh, points in space, usually in the order of uh, five to 10 meters. Um, and then they also had the observers then judge the distance between those two points that they walk to individually. And what they find is that, um, uh, and this is actually not the data from the, the specific experiment, but we know from blind walking that all the way up to um, distances exceeding 20 meters, the the judgment of the distance of the object is quite accurate, as you can see from these various studies um, at various distances ranging from two meters to 20 meters using the blind walking paradigm. But in the experiment that I mentioned to you, where they asked the observer to to match a frontal parallel interval to the perceived depth separation between the two points, we find that there is um, a foreshortening, and this is this is shown by the fact that these lines are actually oriented upwards as you go in distance. So um, the match depth should fall on this line if, if, there was, if there was vertical perception of the depth separation as there appear to be vertical perception of the distances of the, um, uh, there was vertical perception of the egocentric distances to the individual objects as measured by blind walking. So, so this sort of um, puts forth the idea that maybe there is a tripartite distinction uh, in uh, perceptual encoding of, of space, not just in pictures or in ordinary perception, but in, in space perception to court. Um, and the idea is that we have, um, first we have what we call the awareness and encoding of unscaled depth structure, that is shape and layout, which is, um, which is, has, I would say, let's say the gain of that depth representation is quite good up to a certain distance, but actually drops off as well. The gain drops off as shown by the Loomis experiments. Um, the awareness and encoding of scale depth structure near space, which um, is uh, underwritten especially by uh, signals like disparity, and that is um, the gain is only um, substantial in the, in the, in the, within the peripersonal space of the observer and drops off dramatically with distance. And then finally, we have the awareness and encoding of ambulatory distance, which, which I'm proposing is, a, is an entirely distinct representation, which um, is actually quite, the gain is, is quite good all the way out into um, uh, in, into action space and beyond to a distance of perhaps 20 to 25 meters. And then only then does it start to, uh, does the gain start to drop. So the idea of this tripartite en encoding model is that um, we, we have these three separate representations and um, the, the, the sense of tangibility and negative space and object realness, which is what we find missing in pictures, is associated with, with the encoding of absolutes, absolute depth. And in pictures, because of the specific uh, form of the visual stimulation, the pictorial objects are not attributed this uh, are not attributed to this um, encoding, and therefore remain uh, represented only in terms of relative depth, and therefore lack that sense of tangibility, um, which can, of course, then be recovered by either using various interventions like anaglyphs or monocular aperture viewing or the synopter and so on. And of course, I can't go into detail about what the logic would be of how that will happen. Uh, we don't have time for that. Um, but the idea is that a combination of this, the encoding of absolute depth in near space and the encoding of distances in ambulatory space give rise to this overall sense of presence and immersivity. So what I'm doing here is I'm dis distinguishing between the sense of tangibility and object realness, which is the idea that the objects that you perceive are real objects that lie in front of you versus this feeling that you are you are occupying a space and you're present in this in the spatial uh, scene that you're perceiving and that uh, I would r refer to as presence and immersivity. So the idea to the idea coming out of this tripartite distinction um, or of uh, the, the encoding of space is that realness and pictoriality exist on a, on a continuum. That is, you could say, ordinarity and pictoriality exist on a continuum where you have a, a strong sense of realness on one end, 
which can arise in pictures, particularly stereoscopic pictures or anaglyphs, uh, or, or, or a weak sense of um, uh, uh, realness. And the same can occur in, in ordinary or real objects, depending on the various conditions, which I'm not going through each one, uh, one by one, but um, various different things like viewing a real scene with one eye, near viewing versus far viewing, and so on. So, um, and similar to this idea of certainty and scale, so I would I was arguing that in, in pictorial viewing there is um, there is a, a complete ambiguity in scale. Well, in in ordinary viewing we have this uh, reduction in the in the certainty of perceived scale with distance, which gives rise to this idea that as you go into vista space you lose that sensation of negative space and tangibility and realness and so on. So. Um, I think this idea of distinct representations um, can argue for this continuity hypothesis, but also account for the duality that we have in pictures. That is, when we look at a picture, when we look at a picture, we we have both a separate representation of the unscaled um, pictorial objects, while we have within the scale representation an awareness of the picture surface itself. And so we we have this sense of duality and this ability. Um, to maybe switch and, and focus on, on, on one aspect, although typically the default is that we look into the picture and therefore uh, perceive the pictorial objects. Um, and then with, does, this, does this theory sort of, um, does this hypothesis uh, make sense in terms of the empirical evidence? I'm just going to point out one idea that um, with monocular stereopsis, uh, when, you, when, when the observer looks through the through the through the aperture, then the idea would be that that the the uncertainty in scale is reduced to the point where the observer is actually perceiving an object that is located somewhere near the picture surface, but now without the uh, awareness of the frame of the picture and so on. And the empirical evidence that we have uh, is consistent with this in the sense that observers, um, naive observers, report that what they perceive is that the object becomes appears closer and smaller than it did in the in the original picture that they viewed uh, binocularly. Um, and also, interestingly, uh, we get observers who describe the effect of the monocular aperture viewing to be very much like the uh, miniaturization effect that they observe um, in the in the tilt shift miniaturization effect, which which sort of ties these two together. So. Um, of course, one of the things, and I think um, a couple of the talks uh, uh, brought up this issue about the the actual encoding in the dorsal stream and how that might account for some of the distinctions between uh, real should, and uh, should really so, conclude now. Because, okay. Yeah. Yeah, I, I think I only have one more slide. So um, uh, yeah. So basically, whether um, where these uh, three encodings might lie and. Uh, the, the idea would be that the uh, encoding of relative depth would be in the early occipital, um, in the lateral occipital early aspects of the dorsal ventral stream, while the awareness and encoding of absolute depth within the late aspects of the dorsal streams, uh, posterior parietal areas, while the awareness of distance and ambulatory scale would be in medial temporal areas in allocortex. Um, and we have some evidence, um, this published work that um, shows that both monocular aperture viewing and binocular stereopsis um, uh, seem to be selectively activating the uh, very similar regions in the posterior parietal cortex. And I just wanted to throw this out that, um, uh, that the representation of the egocentric distance is likely um, uh, underwritten by something uh, resembling the, the grid cells in the entorhinal cortex. So in conclusion, both pictorial and ordinary space and object perception are a perceptual outcome of the outputs of three distinct spatial systems driven by a specific configuration of visual cues available. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So we should quickly move to the next speaker, which is Alberto Voltolini, speaking about ordinary perception and pictorial perception. Okay, can you hear me and see the slides? 
Yes. Okay, very good. So what I want to try to do in, in this talk is uh, to show how we can justify Bollheim's idea according to which both pictorial perception is a form of perception, even though a sui generis one, and secondly, which is the most important thing in order to uh, understand this uh, theory compared, for instance, with the Gombrich theory, the idea that uh, not only uh, Victoria perception is constituted by the two folds, uh, which we have already talked about, but these two folds are for him compenetrated in a way as to create in a sort of fusion experience, if you like, uh, in the sense that uh, neither of the fold, called the folds, coincides uh, with the uh, perception in isolation, either of the vehicle of the picture or, or what the picture presents that is the subject. So uh, in the two folds, uh, the vehicle and the subject are perceived in a different way as compared to the way in which they would be perceived if they were perceived say, face to face. And I want to show how this, uh, uh, this account might be justified and completed since Volem was very elusive, uh, as anyone knows about that. First, uh, the idea is that uh, we have to conceive the configurational fold as having a content that differs from the content that uh, it would have the mere perception of the vehicle taken in isolation, because the, uh, the fold is an enriched content insofar as it is the grasping of a pictorial vehicle in the sense that uh, uh, it grasps also some properties that could not be grasped by looking at the vehicle in isolation. And these properties are the properties that uh, are a specific sort of grouping properties, properties that have to do with the third dimension, in point of fact, it is that they have to do with the figure ground segmentation that many talks already talked about. In general, grouping properties are the properties for another elements to be arranged in a certain directional order and a certain dimension. But here what counts is precisely that the dimension is the third one that we manage to see in something that is actually flat, a sort of three dimensional structure. And this is definitely shown by Ospedonian pictures, such as, for instance, the famous picture of a Dalmatian that uh, paradigmatically show how it is different to, to see a vehicle in isolation and to see a vehicle as a pictorial vehicle. For a, When you see the vehicle in isolation, as if it were just uh, an object among many other objects, uh, you simply see some uh, black and white uh, uh, two-dimensional patches. But uh, uh, you start seeing that as a sort of pictorial vehicle when you manage precisely to uh, provide that sort of figure ground segmentation that allows you to make a sort of uh, uh, difference between a silhouette that stands uh, in front of you and some other things uh, that stand uh, on the background. And uh, so that you have to create what people call uh, sometimes illusory or subjective contours. And uh, it is there at that very point uh, that you are managing to entertain a particular seen in experience in which you not only see the vehicle, but you also see uh, or grasp the subject of the picture. Uh, in this respect, the configurational fold still has <laughs> a merely non-conceptual content in that this sort of operation might be prompted by some sort of conceptual triggering, if you like, some sort of expectation, but this is not forced. For sometimes uh, the very sort of figure ground segmentation uh, might also happen as a sort of bottom-up process, not as a top-down one. As for instance, in the case of the double cross that Wittgenstein pointed out in this case, it, but it might also be the case of the Kanitsa triangle that can be recognized in this particular three-dimensional setting also for uh, by uh, non-conscious uh, uh, non-conscious animals. Um, so this shows in which way the configurational fold is different from the perception of the vehicle in isolation. Uh, but on the other hand, once we see the configurational fold in this way, we manage also to see how it can be combined with the, uh, with the recognitional fold 
for in the configuration unfold, once we managed to provide precisely that sort of figured ground segmentation, we are able to grasp silhouettes in a way uh, that are, so to speak, matched by what you see in the other fold of the experience, in which you see not mere silhouettes, but in which you see uh, properly three-dimensional objects uh, that are conceptualized in a certain way. This is something on which uh, Volheim himself already insisted. He said that uh, uh, the recognition of fold as a conceptual content in the sense that we might say nowadays that it is strongly or maybe even super strongly cognitively penetrated. That is, you cannot have in the recognition of fold a perception of the subject unless you conceive that very subject under a certain particular concept that might be even, of course, a, a very uh, a very not sophisticated concept, but still you need it. And why do you need it? Because uh, precisely for the reasons that the Reich was appealing to before, in point of fact, uh, you are in a way, in your experience, uh, when you are entertaining an experience that uh, uh, turns out to be a pictorial experience, uh, you locate, uh, in a way, uh, both the vehicle uh, uh, so enriched and the subject in the very same space. In this sense, uh, a pictorial experience as such takes a brand according to which it is an illusory experience for somehow the subject, so to speak, pops up as if it were a sort of illusion, but that it is still located in the very same space uh, as uh, the space in which the vehicle is, uh, is located. And it is precisely for the reason that Danrej appealed to before that in point of fact, uh, you see uh, the subject uh, in a different uh, sort of uh, uh, relative depth with respect to the way in which you see the vehicle, because once you see the vehicle, uh, the vehicle becomes a sort of, of obtruder, so to speak, uh, that uh, in a way obstaculates the sort of uh, uh, perception that you have of, of the subject. In point of fact, if you were really deluded by, uh, by a picture, as in the few, very few cases of genuine trompe what it would happen would precisely be that you would merely perceive uh, the subject as, as such, and you would, as Dan Raj was saying in the case of uh, the monocular case in which you see just a picture by uh, a single aperture, as if it were just uh, one single object located in the space in front of you. So precisely because of this co-location, you need to have a sort of a device that allows you to identify the subject as being different from the vehicle, because you cannot rely on the normal system by means of which you identify objects in front of you. That is the sort of demonstrative non-conceptual identification that we normally uh, provide and rely on when you have a sort of ordinary perception of, uh, of the situation. Put in, in a sort of metaphorical way, it is as if we were perceiving two dots, not only one dot, that we locate in one and the same space. And it is precisely because we locate them in one and the same space that we need a way to differentiate, to distinguish the second dot from the first dot, which we would not need if we uh, simply locate uh, those objects uh, in different locations of one and the same space. In that case, which appears, happens in normal perception, one could rely on merely demonstrative and non-conceptual identification. So in a way, this shows why there is a sort of compenetration between the two folds. For on the one end, you have a, a, a non-conceptual content in the configurational fold of a sort of silhouette of a K-wise form that matches the uh, recognition of all conceptual content of the vehicle that is seen as a thing of uh, that very kind under a certain content. This is the, the side of uh, uh, the pictorial perception that is definitely illusory because you have this sort of a seen as, the, the, the recognition of all amounts to a seen as experience in which you see the vehicle 
as being something that the vehicle actually is not. For instance, you see a certain canvas as being a very charming woman in the case, say, of Mona Lisa in the very famous example. So in this sense, the recognitional fold depends on the cognition, on the configurational fold, but it does not ipso facto supervene on it, precisely because in order to grasp and to entertain the recognitional fold, you need a sort of conceptual mastery. As it can be shown, for instance, in this very case, if you look, forget for one second the, the Matisse picture, but if you look at the Hermann Grid case, in which uh, you, you don't have a proper pictorial experience, but still you have a sort of illusory impression that you see some circles, some gray circles at the crossing between the uh, white lines. Uh, it is that the sort of, uh, uh, of uh, uh, <coughs> figure ground segmentation that you manage to provide uh, also in the case of a pictorial experience, for you see the circles uh, as if they stand, uh, so to speak, in front of the white lines. But you don't manage to see them a picture, precisely because you don't conceptualize the scene that you are facing in a particular way. And this is why, by the way, one of the last, uh, yeah, I take the, uh, the last paintings by Matisse, precisely as case in, in which one does not know whether one is, one is entertaining a, a pictorial perception or not, precisely because one does not know whether one is conceptualizing the scene that one is uh, illusorily facing or not. Uh, so this shows that uh, the, the two folds uh, are genuinely perception, uh, perceptual because... The, you have two minutes. Okay, splendid. I have two more slides. The configurational uh, fold is an enriched perception of the vehicle, and the recognitional fold is an illusory perception of the vehicle, which is recognized as such precisely because you also see the vehicle. If you were not seeing the vehicle, if you were really deluded by the Trump, uh, by, by, uh, by the picture, as in the case of genuine Trumplers, you would not have this sort of uh, uh, knowing illusory perception of the subject. You would only entertain an illusory perception of that very subject. Now, the last thing to say, what I said is would be compatible with the idea that the recognitional fold were a case of imagination rather than a perception, because also the imagination is cognitively penetrated, as Walton has maintained, for instance. But there are two reasons as to why uh, this hypothesis has to be ruled out. First, as I said, the, the recognitional fold is constrained by the configurational fold as it not would be the case if its nature were imaginative. You are not free to see what you see, to grasp what you grasp in the recognitional fold. And second, a, a particular case in, in which you recover from a perception of a genuine trompe l'oeil precisely uh, shows uh, that uh, in that sort of recovering, when you realize that a trompe l'oeil is a trompe l'oeil, amounts to a seeing in experience in which that illusory perception becomes uh, an illusory fold, that is the recognitional fold, that is, knows, uh, is known as illusory precisely because the vehicle comes to be seen in the configurational fold. So this shows uh, in which sense uh, the, the, the scene in experience is a perceptual state, although a sui generis one. I think I can stop here. Thank you, Alberto. <clears throat> Okay, so we're now ready for the last but not least talk by John Zainbekis, The Disunity of Picture Perception. John. Hi, uh, so I'm going to discuss, I'm, I'm going to argue that picture perception is not, uh, that the concept of picture perception covers uh, several very different kinds of state, so there's no unity to the concept. And then I'm going to use that conclusion to discuss the concept, the idea that picture perception is characterized by some form of duality. So I'll reject one form, one classical form of duality and defend another one and say that it's worth exploring. Uh, so of the three kinds of uh, picture perceptions that I'm going to describe, the first are cognitively driven picture perceptions. Uh, in these cases, uh, vision, outputs very nat uh, naturally a uh, representation 
of a two-dimensional, uh, irregularly stained surface. The information from monocular cues, disparity, all of this conspires to, to produce this veridical perception. However, uh, if we want to, we can engage in the kinds of activities that Leonardo described. Uh, for example, in the figure on the, on the left, instead of seeing it as a, as a shadow on a wall, perhaps you can imagine that it's a corner, a corner of a dark room with the light coming from uh, from the right. Or you can perhaps see it as a convexity as well, with the light coming from the left. The figure on the on the right, uh, again, it's an irregularly stained uh, flat surface. Uh, here, some semantic information is useful. You can perform a, a figure ground segregation if you imagine that the, gra that the foreground is, um, uh, say, a sandy stretch, and behind that there are some reeds or sand or something like that. Uh, now, these kinds of uh, activities, uh, they're activities, the acts of visualizing. Uh, there's quite a good description of activities in perception by Thomas uh, Crafter in a paper of his from 2010, where he describes watching uh, or directing attention as actions performed in the, in the framework of perceptual episodes. He also isolates a, a structure of certain perceptual activities, which is teeling. So uh, let's say that it's, they have the structure of accomplishments. There's a before and after, and <laughs> the accomplishment requires some kind of uh, conscious uh, mental effort. Now, in these cases, in cognitively driven picture perceptions, what sustains visual representations of volumetric shape and depth relations is this mental effort. It sustains literally the picture perception. Of course, other parts of perception are active as well, but generally in perception, but here, the idea is that volume and shape, uh, sorry, sorry, volume and depth are assigned as a consequence of making these mental efforts. And these picture perceptions are not very robust because very often, uh, naturally, vision will just restore the experience of a planar surface. Although the brain seems to have a habit, once the semantic information is available, of imposing it more easily than the first time around. Now, at the other end of the scale, we have uh, picture perceptions. So these are picture perceptions which are essentially actions. Now at the other end of the scale we have picture perceptions which uh, function, these simply are perceptions. And these are usually uh, trompe l'oeil experiences. Here, uh, monocular cues for depth and volume are consistent, there's no conflict. Sometimes, as in this case, um, there's a failure to register the absence of effects from disparity due to distance or the subject, which can be low relief, or a combination of both. In this case, for example, the window casings and door casings at that distance are sufficiently low relief subjects uh, for us not to immediately notice that there's a lack of effect from disparity. And another uh, useful uh, technique in trompe l'oeil is uh, embedding of the picture in the context so that it doesn't attract attention particularly. So for as long as these conditions last, uh, you can end up having a perceptual state in the following sense it causes a belief. In fact, it causes a perceptual belief, so functionally it's a perception. Now, the third type, and last of the ones that I'm going to describe, there's a fourth which I won't discuss today, but the third type of picture perception are visually driven picture perceptions. In this case, by the time you reach uh, awareness of the scene in front of you, vision has already constructed uh, representations of volumetric shapes and depth relations. It's all due to monocular cues in this case, because disparity and parallax are obviously not responsible here for constructing these representations of depth and volume. Uh, so if there are to be such uh, visually driven picture perceptions, there are two kinds of analyses of uh, monocular cues and how they work in picture perception. One kind is where uh, techniques uh, are described in pictures. So, for example, Cutting and Bishton had this quite classic article on layout, on depth layout, or this, this uh, the very interesting article uh, by Cutting and Massaroni on how vision interprets lines. Now, uh, I always read these studies as if they're claiming that the abilities exploited by these cues are also exploited by object perception, but perhaps I'm wrong about this. Also, it's not so clear that in all cases, for example, in Cutting and Maceroni's cases, it's subpersonal processing that is generating uh, the perceptions, the three-dimensional perceptions. 
So for those reasons, I'm very attracted to uh, studies which don't focus on pictures. One very systematic, overly systematic perhaps, but a very nice uh, systematic picture if it worked, of uh, how we construct shape and depth uh, in vision is Mars. So Mar th these, these are descriptions of monocular cues without disparity by Mar, so they should automatically apply to, to picture perception. And they also give this much needed continuity with object perception in the sense that was isolated in discussion earlier. So Mar distinguishes uh, cues which seem to signal uh, discontinuities in the orientation of the surface, or shape from shading, and so forth. And more uh, speculatively, he also argues that if we see the section of a regular three-dimensional shape, the brain applies a geometric projection algorithm to spit out an accurate representation of the three-dimensional shape. And that is connected also with his thesis about recognition from components of objects not always having regular shapes. He argues that objects can be analyzed into regular shapes. Uh, now, I think that's a weakness in, in Mars' theory, but since then there has been quite a lot of work, for example, Kendry, Todd and colleagues, which suggests that we can also assign volumetric shapes for irregular shapes uh, quite accurately, which could complete Mars' work. Now, why am I so interested in, uh, in Mars in particular? It's because Mars' theory is modular, and he argues that these visual interpretations are generated subpersonally. This is in conflict with the Bayesian theories, in some cases at least, it's, it may be, I think in all cases, Bayesian theories seem to require a locus in, in which competing interpretations are compared. That might not be consistent with Mars modularity, but the important thing, uh, I think, in Bayesian theories as well as in Mars, is that vision is supposed to generate these, generate these interpretations, these visual interpretations, by the, by the time we become aware of the scene. So my working hypothesis for visually driven picture perceptions is that there is a class of perceptions in which subpersonal processes construct depth and volume, and therefore these perceptions, picture perceptions, are fluent and require no agent of contribution, and that suffices for me to distinguish them from the first kind of uh, uh, picture perception that I described. Incidentally, when a uh, picture perception is visually driven, uh, if you want to try to have a visual experience of the picture as a planar surface, you have to engage in mental activities of the kinds described earlier for cognitively driven perceptions. Their accomplishments, they require a lot of mental effort. I, I guess many people here have tried to play this game, but this is a picture from uh, this is a picture with a very strong monocular volumetric cue. It's the, the intersection in the middle. Uh, but you can see the figure as planar if, for example, you're told that it's an hexagon or you're told to count the sides. You can begin to distract attention from this very powerful monocular cue and see that it's a, a, a planar a, a planar shape with six sides. Now, uh, I'm, I, having shown that some picture perceptions are not perceptions at all but actions, others are not picture perceptions but plain perceptions, <laughs> and others are visually driven uh, states uh, which are not functionally perceptions, uh, I try to use uh, this outcome to uh, talk about the concept of duality in picture perception. In philosophical accounts of picture perception, Duality means duality either within an experience or of experiences. Now, as we saw in both cognitively and driven and visually driven picture perceptions, it's possible within the time frame of a mental action to have both experiences of a planar surface and the visual experience whose contents are three dimensional. However, we also saw that the two sets of experiences are separated by the structure of a very demanding mental action. It requires a lot of effort mentally. And that leaves out visually driven picture perceptions, which are fluent and require no mental effort. By the time you become aware of the scene, you already have the picture content. So seeing in, uh, as classically described in philosophical accounts, uh, only characterizes cognitively driven picture perceptions, and it can't be generalized to define picture perception. However, uh, in both cognitively and visually driven picture perceptions, there is a distinct experience of the picture as an object. And the reason I say that is very simple, is that uh, when you're looking at a picture on your cell phone screen or a postcard, uh, 
you have a belief that it's a picture, that it's a flattish object, uh, and that belief is not inferred, uh, it's based on a perception. It's a perceptual belief and it's based on a perception without how you having to make any inferences. So there must be a perceptual experience of a, not of a planar surface exactly, of an object, an object, a flattish object usually. Uh, now this duality cannot be the same as seeing in because it's present in visually driven picture perceptions as well as cognitively driven ones, whereas seeing in is only present in the cognitively, visual, uh, cognitively driven cases. Uh, this duality simply means that vision generates both visual states of three-dimensional contents and object perceptions of the picture, plain object perceptions. And there's no conflict in this between this duality and cognitively driven picture perceptions, they're just actions. However, uh, this form of duality does raise an important question, it's why visually driven picture perceptions, which after all simply exploit object perception processes on my uh, thesis, why they don't have the functional role of perception. And here we have a few replies already uh, available, and I'm just going to write a note on those replies, and then I'm closing. Am I, how am I for time, actually, uh, Nicola? Who, who, sorry, who is it who's chairing? Uh, um, how much time do I have? It doesn't matter. OK. You so, have... Uh, you have four minutes, John. Ah, OK, excellent. Thanks. Uh, apologies, I, uh, my mic was off. It's OK. Uh, so uh, I was saying that uh, visually driven picture perceptions seem to uh, be generated by vision alongside plain object perceptions of the pictures as objects. And the question is, what exactly is the status of visually driven picture perceptions? That's not a problem that emerges for the other kinds of perception, either the illusion, perceptual illusions, or else they're cognitively driven, or else they're just mental actions. Here it is a problem. Why and how does vision solve this problem, as it were? And my the solution I favor is that cognitively driven, visually driven picture perceptions are simply not perceptual states. And here are some proposals that go in that direction. Uh, perhaps the most classic proposal is that uh, the states in which disparity and parallax don't play any role in constructing visual content. Um, a second proposal is the absence of subject dependence. So, in other words, that the, the, what is depicted in the picture doesn't respond to sensory exploration. You find that description in Kubavi, for example, and in Cutting. Um, another type of explanation is Mathen's uh, very interesting work which is already quite old, on the lack of engagement of uh, the motion guiding system, accompanied according to Martin by the lack of a feeling of presence. And finally, uh, Dan Raj's uh, hypothesis about absolute scaling. Now, I think that one and two in this list are consistent. I also think that three and four in this list are consistent, but I want to try to show that one and four are consistent, so that these four conditions can be used jointly as conditions uh, which prevent a visual state from being a perception, from playing the functional role of a perception. So why do I think that one and four are consistent and can be used together? Uh, let's go back to uh, illusions, to trompe l'oeil, where, uh, as we said, uh, this, the, the illusion can be favored uh, by the lack of information from, by the lack of detection uh, but by the fact that as long as we don't detect that there's a lack of response to parallax in the scene and to disparity. How would one and four explain uh, these perceptual illusions? Well, on the disparity and parallax uh, hypothesis, the perceptual illusion occurs as long as there's no effect, from, as long as we don't detect the lack of disparity. But once it's detected, the perception is dispelled. On the absolute scaling hypothesis, the illusion occurs because absolute scaling is present, despite information from disparity being absent, and absolute scaling is present here. So this does confirm uh, the first question A here, uh, does seem to confirm um, Dan Raj's uh, hypothesis. However, on the absolute scaling hypothesis, I'm not sure I see what, allow, what explains how the illusion is dispelled, because absolute scaling should not be suspended because the, the depicted objects here, for example, I don't know if you can see my arrow, but 
but here uh, the window and door casings are roughly at the kind of distance that they would be at if this wasn't uh, a fixture. So I fail to see why the absolute scaling ability is disactivated once you discover that it's a trompe l'oeil. So my proposal about one and four is the following. Absolute scaling suffices to cause a function of perception even when there's no information from disparity. And we shouldn't make uh, perception depend on disparity because it's, it's obvious that absolute scaling can suffice to cause a perceptual state. However, when vision should register effects from disparity and parallax and fails to do so, the perception is dispelled. Therefore, I make the following proposal that object perception needs both of these. It needs both absolute scaling and failure to detect the absence of effects from disparity. In, visu in visually driven picture perceptions, both one and four, or sorry, both absolute scaling and uh, failure to detect the absence of effects of disparity are absent. And that, as I said earlier, I think that the other points in this list are all consistent. So my proposal is that points one through four are what characterize visually driven picture perceptions and prevent them from being uh, functionally speaking perceptions. So that's it. Thank you very much. And thanks, by the way, to Alberto and Nicola for inviting me to this uh, amazing meeting. Thank you very much. Uh, and and that concludes the, the program for the talks, but we do have time in theory because we are running a little late uh, due to technical problems and mishaps. Um, I think we can give ourselves a few minutes for questions. I guess questions uh, to the speakers or the last session, but also other questions, I guess, if anybody. So let me see. So we have Marco Meneghelli. Go ahead. Thank you, um, Professor Bruno. Um, Professor Bruno in English, uh, with the accent. <laughs> um, a question to Darangi, uh, the second one uh, who has uh, told. Are you there? Darangi? Yes, I'm here. Sorry, I had my camera turned off. Uh, so, about um, um, the question. Uh, uh, is, is to all the four uh, the four uh, speakers, but in particular to you. Mm -hmm. um, as uh, Vittorio Gallese uh, has said at the beginning, the, um, the very beginning of, of uh, this conference, there is a distinction in English between image and picture. A linguistic distinction uh, from the dictionary or an encyclopedia <laughs> depends on from the point of view. But uh, the question is: uh, the the distinction is only is technical? Is use is in use in the science uh, of language or or in, in this uh, kind of uh, idiolect? Uh, or um, the question is: uh, for example, I think about the famous song by The Cure, a picture, Pictures of You. In this, in, uh, so about the pictorial view and the, the linguistic distinction in English between picture and image. So, picture, uh, uh, I, 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 I come uh, immediately to the example, a, a photograph, a photography. Um, the question is photographic and photogrammatic. A photo is a picture or is an image? What is a photo? It's just the problem of impressionists, the, 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 the painters, the French painters. Um, and uh, so the question is, uh, today, have we seen together pictures or images? So the problem is, uh, this is my uh, statement, the problem is cognitive, as you have said, Daranji. The distinction is cognitive between image and uh, 
picture R is simply simplest, simpler linguistic and logical. Okay. Or, uh, okay. Yeah, I think it's clear. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Thank, thanks for the question. I think I think that is a, a very important distinction. And I think uh, some of that distinction maybe I'm sort of hand waving towards with that first slide where I said, um, and you know, again, comes out in things like the configurational fold versus the recognitional fold. Um, and yes, I think I would probably use the word picture for, for the stuff that I'm talking about, which is um, a picture as a vehicle to express a three dimensional scene. But of course, a picture can be many things. And I think in, in our field, the usage of picture is in that sense. And I think image, at least for me, would be something more. Of course, we can say pictorial image and then we mean the same thing. And I'm guilty of misusing these terms. But I, perhaps, as you say, I think image is, is a broader term. And um, and maybe we need a term to distinguish those things. And I feel like some of the things that, you know, Michael uh, was referring to, you know, starts getting into that realm where we need to, um, especially when we think about aesthetics and art, where, where the configurations start breaking down from our typical photographic three-dimensional uh, um, understanding. I think, yeah, the idea of an image and uh, as, as separate from, um, uh, picture perception and I think when we say picture perception we mean the depiction of a three-dimensional scene that that would be my uh, take on it but I, I agree that the image side is is a huge area that is ripe for investigation I think a lot of the earlier speakers covered that yeah thank you great so let's move on to the next question Enrico Terrone thank you uh, I have a question for Alberto Bertolini um, uh, both uh, John uh, and Anraji in their talk pointed out the uh, um, di important difference in the phenomenology of pictorial experience with respect to the phenomenology of uh, ordinary vision. For instance, uh, uh, the sense of actual depth uh, in ordinary vision uh, in contrast uh, with the, the sense of relative depth in uh, uh, picture perception. I wonder how you can reconcile uh, your uh, uh, claim that um, uh, picture perceptions involve a, 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 co a co uh, knowingly illusory experience of, of the scene uh, with this difference in phenomenology. Is the knowingly the knowingly component of the illusion that can turn the, the actual uh, uh, depth uh, and size into relative depth and size, or what else? Yeah, thank you, Enrico. It is the knowing factor, but because of the way in which we know uh, that we are entertaining an illusion, which is a particular and precisely perceptual way, in the sense that we know that the, uh, that the grasping of the subject is illusory once we perceive the vehicle. So it is a completely different matter for, say, other cases in which one might entertain, say, knowing illusory experiences. Yes, as when I know, for instance, is the case of the Müller-Lear experience uh, that the two segments uh, are actually of the same length. So yes, I know that my experience is illusory, but in that case, my knowledge is grounded not in the very same uh, experiential modality. It is the fact that, as I said, uh, the vehicle works as a <coughs> visual uh, obtruder, so to speak, that makes it the case that the subject is perceived as having a relative depth and also that it is frozen, in the, as Michael pointed out, uh, under a particular perspective. Thank you. Okay. So, uh, Michael, Michael Kubovi. Michael? Yes, uh, my question is to Alberti, uh, to, to, to Alberto, sorry. Uh, Alberti is also an interesting interlocutor, but he's not here. <laughs> it would be nice. Um, <clears throat> you were talking about the Dalmatian picture, and I was curious where the evidence is that this could happen spontaneously as a bottom-up process. It seems to me 
that the uh, <clears throat> that this is a particularly difficult puzzle to solve. And my guess is that very few people would solve it spontaneously uh, bottom up that usually in classes I have several students who uh, who take a long time and need a great deal of prodding. So I think that the, that that point is is a bit difficult and I I wanted just to add one more point which is you talked about the uh, representational uh, uh, aspect of the of uh, pictures and you talked about a cognitive or conceptual component and so I don't understand how you reconcile that with uh, your view that the two are purely perceptual. Uh, thanks Michael. As to the first question I agree with you that in that particular case normally at least uh, uh, the sort of uh, perception that we entertain is cognitively driven because uh, if we don't know that we have to see a, a dog or a Dalmatian, it is very hard that, that we start to provide uh, that sort of uh, figure ground segmentation that according to me is needed in order to have the pictorial experience. But at least in theory, uh, one might have cases in which uh, it is uh, some sort of uh, bottom-up process uh, that takes place. For instance, in the case, in a different case, which is in a way even more complicated because it's a case of ambiguous pictures such as the double cross. In the double cross case, in order to grasp the two aspects, uh, you definitely don't need to uh, possess the notion of a cross in order to do that. And this is because even very small children are able, very little children are able to perform that. And as to your second question, it is precisely, uh, I take it that uh, the recognition of fold, at least to my mind, is the only example in which you have a, a genuinely cognitively penetrated experience. And in that sense, uh, uh, you have a perception, but it is still a different sort of perception from the perception that we normally entertain. For I agree with modularists that normally, uh, perception is not cognitively penetrated, uh, at least as far as early the stage of early perception is concerned. This is one of the way in which, according to me, um, uh, picture perception, as far as the recognition of call for this concerned, uh, is perception, but it's special. It's unlike uh, ordinary perception. Okay. Uh, so. Next question from Fabrizio Calzavarini. I got a, another question from Alberto. I probably know the answer, but anyway, so um, if I understand well, uh, you consider the three dimensional grouping properties as part of the configurational fold. So if we stick with the meta and I accounts, uh, then we might expect that the dorsal stream is activated from this uh, three dimensional, is also activated from three dimensional uh, grouping properties. And this, this, this is interesting because this, my, this is consistent with, with some data that have shown that the dorsal stream is also sensi sensitive to the depth, uh, uh, although to a lesser extent, the real object perception. And in principle, this might only, uh, also explain away, so to speak, some um, uh, some uh, activation of the dorsal stream for for the pictures, because uh, uh, usually it's interpreted as as uh, the reason for this dorsal activation is due to depicted objects. But maybe it, it is the vehicle that try drift this activation. Indeed, this might be control case by case, but in principle, the, this might offer an explanation that is different from that, what is normally. Uh, so uh, do you agree with that? Yeah, I completely agree with that. Uh, first of all, note that in the Mate 9 I account, uh, the dorsal system is activated as far as pictorial perception is concerned, but just as regards the vehicle, not as regards uh, uh, the subject. This is why, as in the experiment that Corrado has provided, uh, the dorsal system is not uh, activated in grasping the affordances, for instance. Uh, but I don't want to rule out that precisely because the, the configuration of all this an enriched perception might be the way in which the dorsal system is activated uh, is uh, in a way larger than the, 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 
the way that uh, Nana, for instance, hypothesized, precisely because it has to grasp the sort of three-dimensional structure. So this would be compatible with the sort of evidence that, for instance, Gabriele uh, Ferretti claims uh, that he has discovered uh, as to the mobilization of the dorsal system, even as far as the picture perception is concerned. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, uh, Christopher, Tyler. Yeah. Hi. Well, I I would have questions for all the speakers, but uh, we're only allowed one. So I'd like to make a general comment that there's been almost no mention of the history of uh, the 20th century history of art, which I interpret as almost entirely an exploration of the two-dimensional, three-dimensional interplay in picture perception. So if I'd, if I'd heard all this, I, that, that would be the talk I would have developed, considering that nobody else mentioned it except for Marco. And it, I interpret that as uh, he, he uh, alluded to it here and there. So I'll, I'll throw this to Marco to comment on that, the lack of any mention of 20th century explorations of picture perception in art. No, uh, uh, thank you. Uh, sorry, Ma Mar Ber Bertamini. Oh, no, 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 no. Ma Marco Bertamini. Actually. Ah, Bertamini, sorry. Uh, sorry. Uh, I, I was thinking you were talking about Wittgenstein, sorry. No, no, no. <laughs> I'm trying to switch my... <laughs> He switched himself off. Marco, we can you, you should just turn on your, your microphone. Yeah, okay, okay. Thank you, Anna. Yes. Yeah, so uh, well, as you as you all know, uh, 20th century is hard to summarize in any one specific direction in terms of the way that art went. But yeah, so uh, exploration in terms of what could be taken away and uh, and 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 it, uh, so a lot of exploration of uh, beyond perceptual cognitive expectations uh, and, and so on. I think the, the issue of, of cognitive versus perceptual has come up several times in various talks where uh, um, uh, interpretations based on, uh, on expectations and um, uh, surprising uh, possible uh, interpretations has come up. Um, maybe maybe artists have done a lot of that in the 20th century. Um, so in a way, moving away from the perceptual mechanisms, although some explored exactly the opposite and the perceptual mechanisms in isolation as well. So, um, uh, yeah, and I don't know if I can say much more than that on, on the 20th century art. Right, if I may just add a little point to that, uh, Christopher, because I I did mention in my talk uh, that in general I, f I find that th this debate about one foldedness, two foldedness uh, is, is is very interesting, but it isn't really easy to apply it to to 20th century art, uh, things like a Jackson Pollock or a Lucio Fontana or a, or a Mondrian. And I totally agree with you that if we're going to make a theory of what pictorial perception really is, it should be a theory that has to have something to say also to those kind of pictures, because those are pictures. There's, I think that is difficult to... to, uh, to uh, particularly in Cubism. Right. Cubism was all about flattening, getting rid of the three-dimensionality and exploring picture perception under those conditions. Mm -hmm. Right. Okay. Uh, so I guess Marco is the next question. Right. So um, what I uh, was trying to think of themes that have come up, and and certainly one big one has been on uh, on on the role of um, cues, um, cues that are present, absent, or in conflict. I think an important distinction is also. A real conflict, as opposed to absence of cues, and 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 sometimes I think that 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 is um, uh, that that they are confused sometimes those two things. Um, so that that was that was certainly um, something uh, relevant to 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 Chris Tyler's talk and and James Cutting and, and others. Um, but um, 
in, in, instead of uh, that, I, I thought uh, of, of asking an even more general question to everybody, um, perhaps trying again to find uh, some, uh, some, some ways of, of seeing what people think. And I think the overarching big questions might be phrased in the following way. So some clearly have made a case for picture perception as being special and that real duality that is uh, unique to picture perception. But many others instead have highlighted the continuity and the similarities uh, between uh, um, different type of uh, uh, perceptual experiences, uh, phenomenological, phenomenological level in particular. So the question is this: <clears throat> Maybe we can use uh, we can use the reactions of the top, if you like, to see who agrees and who disagrees. So is picture does it make sense to think of pictures perception as special, or to put it another way, sort of uh, with Plato, is picture perception as opposed to other perceptions, as opposed to everyday perception, carving nature at its joints? So you you could all reply by by either putting the thumb up. Or, or, or just laughing at it with the reactions at the top, if you like. What was the question again? Is the question is is the distinction picture perception and ordinary perception carving nature at its joint? Is it picture perception special, different? Um, I think it's special. Yeah. I'll say it's special. <laughs> yeah, then we, we have at the top a thumb up. We don't have a thumb down. I'd be, I'd be my mind be would be a thumb down. <laughs> <laughs> so wait, Marco, did you say you don't think it's special? I don't think it's special, no. I, I don't think it's special in a fundamental way. You know? Right, OK, OK, OK. Um, maybe I mean, that's of course, there are plenty of differences, but uh, depending on which cues, uh, conflicts we have, and so on. But right. this is special in a fundamental way. Okay, so in that I, case, I would probably be thumbs down too. Um, I, I guess for me, it's special in the sense that it 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 gives up effects that we don't see in in you know. And I think more at the, in that what I'm calling the recognitional domain. And I think Michael and um, uh, Nicola and uh, James and stuff touched on, and you also touched on some of those, some of those types of things. And I think from that perspective, I do see them as as something very special. But yes, if you if you say is it special in the sense that there is a module in the brain that is doing this, then no. Um, it, it, it's 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 combination of activity is causing something to happen in the brain using the normal structures that is different from ordinary perception. But um, anyway, I'll I'll stop there. I'd, I'd like to, to make one comment very briefly. <clears throat> Pictures are unique in the sense that you can move toward them and away from them. In other words, you're in physical control of the, uh, <clears throat> of the detail that you see and therefore the salience of the surface relative to the content. Well, I, I, I thought that Nico made a very good distinction. His, his third category is, is that they're a communication. So what we mean by a picture is not just a random selection from the world, but is something intentionally selected or designed to communicate something. So to me, that's that third aspect is very important in the nature of what it means to be a picture. Well, to follow up what Chris is saying, Look, uh, pictures didn't exist until 100,000 years ago. And if you look at a tree, it doesn't look like a person. Uh, if there is a picture of a giraffe around, that's remarkable because there were no other things that looked like giraffe in heaven or on earth. And so the arrival of pictures was a truly remarkable thing in human history, in the history of the world. And that deserves very special attention, pretty much as much attention as the arrival of grammatical language.
What's also remarkable is that there were no giraffes or rhinos in the places that they were painting those cave paintings. Oh, I didn't so know that. Yeah. <laughs> I find that very difficult okay. to believe. We should, we'll have to I guess we should, we should continue following the order uh, of um, raised oh, heads. Okay. But, uh, but I do agree with you, John, that there is an issue uh, about uh, the evolution of pictorial perception that certainly deserves uh, uh, our attention, uh, and uh, it's, uh, we don't know much about it, actually. Uh, so, Robert, Robert Briscoe. Uh, this, I guess, is a question for everyone, um, and it's a question about why we call the pictorial surface the vehicle of pictorial representation. Um, I think in the context of Good some point. talk, vehicle just means that the pictorial surface is the optical cause of pictorial perception and ultimately pictorial understanding. Um, in other talks, the surface is taken to be that which serves as a representation of the depicted object. And I think normally philosophers think of the surface as both. It's both the optical cause as well as the vehicle of representation where we're understanding representation and you know something like the way we understand representation the philosophy of language and linguistics but it's it's possible to um to divide things up differently um in, in my own work about pictorial representation i tend to think of the surface as the optical cause of pictorial perception and objects in pictorial space as the vehicles of pictorial representation so i think we model uh, objects in the world using virtual models in pictorial space, and something like the way architects and engineers um, construct virtual models of objects using uh, computer-aided design. And I think of pictures as, you know, a kind of, um, um, you know, non-technological analog to um, computer-aided design. And if you look at the history of architectural drawing, um, there, there's a phase where, you know, perspective drawing is quite important and uh, architects are really trying to model depth and three-dimensional structure using what you might think of as a virtual model in pictorial space. And then there's a kind of backlash against that and a turn towards axonometric drawings and drawings that are orthographic where you can really take measurements off the pictorial surface. And then the surface really does become kind of the vehicle of pictorial representation. Um, and you might use a uh, a real world model or a model in virtual space to uh, in, in pictorial space to supplement that um, that surface based representation. Um, so the question is really, what do we mean when we say that the surface is the vehicle of representation here? That's a question for everyone. I take it, if I may uh, provide an answer to, to, to Rob's question, the vehicle here is used in a sort of technical sense. It's something like physical substrate. In fact, as you know, there is a sort of uh, uh, long-standing debate, for instance, in the case of the, the imagery debate as to whether the vehicle of imagination, of mental imagery, is uh, picture-like or sentence-like. I guess that vehicle is used in this sense, uh, and in this very sense, we might even say that, even say a linguistic expression has this sort of vehicle insofar as it carries the meaning, if you like. So in a very neutral way, I would say. Right, so, so it's something that has, you know, syntactic or quasi-syntactic properties. Okay. Uh, we have five minutes left uh, in our scheduled uh, meeting time. I just learned, but uh, well, you probably have to. Um, so we should probably uh, at least terminate the, 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 the list of questions. Uh, uh, but we still have five minutes. So, John, if you want to uh, make your point. Uh, OK, I was very interested in what uh, Chris uh, was presenting as a queue and conflict resolution process. Uh, I was very puzzled about it. See, I think if uh, I had five sources of information, one of which was reliable, and I was seeking information, I would choose the reliable one. 
I wouldn't try to add in anything else that I thought was unreliable because it strikes me that would make my errors increase. I would be guaranteeing that I'd probably make an error if I have two sources of con two sources of information and they contradict each other and one of them is reliable and the other one is less reliable and I choose to mix the two. I've moved away from the most reliable. It seems to me your job when you get conflict as a perceiver is to work out why you have conflict and choose the best information that you can at the time and ignore distracting stuff. But at the same time, as I was listening to Chris, I was thinking that's a very useful um, analysis. And I wonder if there are implications for serious, regular, perceptual error. Are there implications in particular for illusion uh, in your um, analysis? And in particular, will, they, will your system help predict the kind of error that you get in trying to read a 2D surface when it is a picture and is full, therefore, of conflicting information about 2D and 3D. I think you may have hit on something that could predict some of the sizes of the illusions if it was developed, uh, or maybe it does already. Chris, what's your reaction to the question? That's a complicated question. Um, but let me focus on the illusion aspect. I mean, the Necker cube, the reliable information about the Necker cube is that it's a flat uh, diagram on a, uh, on a flat piece of paper. So why do we want to see it popping out in depth when, when we know that's not real? That's not what is physically present before us. It suggests that there are these interpretations. What I, you know, Richard Gregory was very keen on the hypothesis testing, which now is called Bayesian um, inference. So um, I think, it, uh, was it uh, uh, Nico was talking about the perception as an exploration? I, I, I'd rather see it much more as hypothesis testing. So you've got a brain full of hypotheses about what may be in front of you and that they're all competing with it. I think you said something similar yourself, all competing with each other and, and giving you a variety of interpretations. And so, and uh, you don't necessarily uh, pick the, the most realistic one, you may pick more interesting ones. I guess that's the sort of response I'd have to your question. OK. Um... I think we're we're really running out of time now, but Dandra, if you can be very quick. And then I think we'll have to stop, unfortunately. What was that? What was that? Oh, I said I lowered my hand um, I, because it, it's it's probably going to be a too lengthy a question. So. Oh, OK, um, so I I think I should probably conclude the meeting at this point. Uh, I'm, I'm afraid that the team will just uh, suddenly turn off the connection or something like that. So uh, let me just say that I, I thank you I thank when you're for, trying yeah. to do this. Huh? Let's all thank Nicola and our organizers for bringing all of this together. Thank you. Thank you for coming. I thought it was a terrific, a terrific uh, experience for me. I, I, it was very, very stimulating. Uh, and uh, so, um, again, thank you and, and, and goodbye to everyone. Thank you. Thanks a lot also on my part. It was really stimulating. I think that we should find uh, another opportunity for us to meet again. Thank you. Thank you, thank you very much. Goodbye. I see you. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye bye. 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 bye.